Hello, my name is Paul Farrow uh, and thank you for the opportunity today to talk about our recently published research that we believe um, provides the, the first convincing evidence um, of the value that professional medical writing support uh, provides uh, with the publication of uh, medical research. So um, I've been a communications director at Oxford Pharmagenesis for just over 10 years, um, working with a, a great team that you can see here. Um, I'm also uh, a contract global publications lead for a top 10 pharma company. Uh, and I have a, a real interest in uh, research and education around publication uh, ethics and good publication practice, heading up our, our uh, interestingly titled Pepper Group at Pharmagenesis and also getting involved in um, educating MSc students uh, at the University of Oxford here in the UK. So why do we conduct this research? Um, basically because medical writing is, is often misunderstood uh, and can get a, a bad press. I remember attending uh, the inaugural meeting of uh, ISMAP, the European meeting of ISMAP back in 2010, uh, where there was quite a, a strong debate between uh, industry leaders uh, from medical communications and pharma uh, and critics of our industry, uh, including Ben Goldacre here, who at the end of the, end of the discussion put out a call for us to provide the evidence to show that we, uh, we add value uh, in medicine and to also root out and, and shame some of, some of the, the bad practices such as ghostwriting and, and non-disclosure of, of clinical research. So it was based on this criticism of our industry that we decided uh, to undertake this research. Now we believe that we add value uh, in medicine, um, but at the time uh, we had a look round to, to look at the evidence upon which our belief is based. Now our industry bodies um, say some, some very positive things about our work. So the European Medical Writers Association say that medical involving medical writers um, may therefore raise the standard of publications and accelerate the writing and publication process. While ISMAP, um, a little bit of a mouthful, but uh, medical writers can often improve the efficiency and effectiveness of manuscript preparation by working with the research team to develop clear and concise manuscripts in a timely fashion. Um, but what is the evidence upon which these are based? So I think this is, is, is sort of demonstrated quite concisely in an article published in Current Medical Research and Opinion in 2012 by Karen Woolley and her colleagues, where they broke it down into to three uh, key themes. So here they state, when medical writers uh, help authors uh, prepare manuscripts, these are less likely to be retracted for misconduct, which is great. They're more compliant with best practice reporting guidelines, even better and they're accepted more quickly for publication. So these are all good things and they, they cited uh, three particular um, published references uh, upon which um, I'm going to concentrate on number 23 here, uh, which is some early research by Adam Jacobs that was published in The Right Stuff, um, which is the, uh, the journal of the European Medical Writers Association and this was done back in 2010. Now Adam and his colleagues um, uh, took a, a look at the, the, the articles published in a single journal, this was CMRO, between 2004 and 2009, uh, and found an association between medical writing support uh, and adherence to the consort uh, best practice guidelines. So essentially medical writers uh, appear to improve um, adherence to the consort checklist, although uh, the difference uh, versus no medical writing was small. Uh, and the, uh, the context of, of, of this uh, result uh, was unclear. So we, we decided to sort of try and build on the research um, that Adam uh, initiated and try and provide further evidence of, of the, the value that we believe we bring um, it to, to medical publications. So we, we'd set out to, to work um, um, with, uh, in a collaboration um, with experts in publication uh, planning and good publication practice. So we, we in, uh, involved Liz Wager, um, who was a, an author of GPP-1 and GPP-3, and also involved with the Committee of Publication Ethics. And also Sally Hopewell, who, who is a member of the Equator Network, uh, based here in Oxford, uh, who uh, originally developed the consort uh, guidelines. I'm pleased to say that our, our research uh, was awarded the best research prize at the annual <coughs> European meetings of ISMAP in 2015. And even better, um, in, in early 2016, in February, uh, our research was published in BMJ Open. So what did we do? Um, well, we used a, a, a broader data source uh, for our sample um, of papers. Um, so we looked at the Biomed Central uh, Publishing House, um, which, since its inception in the year 2000, uh, has been published, has now publishes over 290 journal titles and in this 15 or so year period it's published over a quarter of a million articles. 
and importantly the Biomed Central journals as well as being open access also uh, uh, make public uh, the peer review process uh, an assessment of, of the quality of written English of the articles and the dates of submission um, of peer review and also of, of acceptance. So going through and looking at all articles published since the, the birth of, of Biomed Central, we were able to uh, interrogate their database and identify um, after manual review 110 articles uh, describing, describing randomized clinical trials that had medical writing support uh, acknowledged or declared. Uh, and we chose at random, based on page numbers, uh, a, a sample as a control uh, of articles again describing randomized controlled trials but did not have declared medical writing support and we compared the two based on the available uh, information uh, for the quality of reporting in the context of the consort statement, the quality of written English as judged by the peer reviewers and also the speed of acceptance uh, and this is what we found. So we found that uh, for six of the 12 uh, consort items that had been shown by previous research to be poorly, poorly reported, we found that medical writing support was associated with a higher rate of reporting. So these were uh, predefined primary outcome, uh, how the sample size was calculated, the type of randomization, the participant flow diagram, uh, the dates of recruitment and follow-up, and also trial registration. Um, so uh, in each of these cases, the evidence supported uh, medical writing support. Now when we looked at the number of articles or the proportion of articles that reported more than 50% of items um, of interest completely, we found that medical writing support um, again uh, was associated with an increased uh, level of reporting. Here you can see 38% uh, when medical writing support was funded by industry. Um, versus uh, a lowly 17.9% when there was mo no medical writing support in industry funded articles and 22.6% um, when there was no medical writing support uh, and articles were developed without industry. So what you can see here is that medical writing support uh, was associated with higher reporting um, of the consort checklist items and this was irrespective of industry and funding. So we were also able to assess, assess uh, quality of written English uh, and this was judged by uh, the peer reviewers who could categorise the, the, the manuscripts into acceptable English, uh, needing some language correction before publication or not suitable for publication unless extensively revised. And with medical writing support we found that 81.1% of articles had acceptable written English versus 47.9% when there was no medical writing support. However, in contrast uh, to what you saw earlier in terms of the, the statements from the industry bodies, we found that the median time from submission to acceptance was slightly longer for articles with medical writing support than those without. It was about 23.9 weeks uh, with writing support versus 19.4 weeks without. Um, and you can see that this is mainly attrib attributable uh, to a longer period in peer review uh, and also a longer amount of time spent uh, responding to reviewer comments. So those are the results of our uh, initial studies um, that were published in BMJ Open. Um, but we were all, all also able to use this uh, data set to perform some secondary analyses that we, that we presented at ISMAP in uh, 2016. So we found here that um, articles that had medical writing support um, were accepted in higher impact factor journals. So here you can see the, the average or the mean impact factor was 2.6 with medical writing support versus 1.8 with, without such support. And we also found this association in uh, the subgroup of articles um, that had industry sponsorship. So here again, uh, similar numbers uh, and a similar significant uh, result. Um, the association with medical writing support uh, also resulted in an increased number of citations in the first year after publication of the articles. So here you can see uh, with medical writing support it was 2.9 citations in the first year versus 1.9 um, when there was no such support. Um, however, when we looked at the subset of articles um, that were industry funded, um, this difference was not statistically significant. We also didn't see any significant differences in other measures of article impact. So we also looked at uh, article views per year, um, similar, similar levels. The, the mean altmetric score uh, and also the citation rate per year. So our, our study um, showed an association between uh, medical writing support and higher 
quality reporting of randomised controlled trials. Um, and the differences between the study groups, um, we, we don't see how they would, would explain the findings. And our secondary analyses suggest that articles with medical writing support are accepted in higher impact journals, although admittedly articles with such support um, were published more recently. So we believe that this is the first research um, to show um, convincing evidence of the value that medical writing uh, brings to the, to the uh, publication of medical research. And we'd certainly recommend that others um, get involved in, in conducting similar research or building on this research. And you, you never know, you might pick up the odd uh, certificate along the way. So there's no point in, in conducting this research um, if we're not putting it in the hands of people who are able to evaluate it and to make decisions. Um, now the ISMAP posters and oral presentations uh, and an ISMAP U presentation in 2015 laid the groundwork and anticipation for, for, for having this research published. Indeed a number of people had asked us to let them know immediately um, when the data were published in a, in a peer-reviewed journal. And when this happened, um, we, uh, it, we, we utilised uh, the, the different uh, communication channels at our disposal um, to ensure that we, we maximised the, the audience uh, of people we wanted to, um, to see our research. So we had a, a news article on the Pharmagenesis website, uh, various social media channels uh, such as direct messages via Twitter to influential tweeters. Uh, we even had a, a Twitter takeover session on the, on the afternoon after release. Uh, press releases to various uh, different uh, networks, author videos, uh, and finally, uh, we were definitely grateful for the support of, of people like Peter Llewellyn from Medcoms Net Networking and Ryan Woodrow from the publication plan who helped um, get this evidence out there. So what was the, the reaction like? Well, we got a very warm reception. Um, we had positive tweets um, from very influential people um, in, in the publishing world, whether they be editors such as, the, uh, such as Trish uh, Groves, who is the deputy editor of the BMJ, Richard Smith, um, who is a former editor of the BMJ, uh, an outspoken critic of, of traditional publication methods. Um, we received congratulations from Adam Jacobs, who conducted uh, the original research, um, and we had uh, articles on the publication plan and the uh, EMWA site. Um, and uh, as of last week, um, about 10 weeks after publication, um, we've achieved a, an altmetric score of 76. Um, an altmetric tells us that there's been 154 tweets from 88 users uh, with an upper bound of uh, nearly 87,000 followers. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that we've got 87,000 people interested. However, we believe that there's a, a, reasonable, a reasonable number of them are. Um, this is the reach of the article after five days post-publication. Uh, we made it into the, the list of top read articles in BMJ <coughs> Open. Um, and it's worth explaining the, uh, the, the figure here uh, in that if you look at uh, our research on the right hand side, uh, within five days um, there had been over 1,700 uh, full text article views um, resulting in an, uh, and an associated altmetric score of 56. If you compare this with uh, an article published in the same journal uh, just the day after, uh, which achieved a higher altmetric score, you can see a very different pattern of how people are uh, utilising the, the BMJ Open site um, to, to read the paper. So they saw a high number of, uh, of abstract reads and a low number of full text views. We saw a relatively low number of uh, abstract reads, but because we were directing our audience directly to the full text article, we saw uh, much higher numbers there. So to date, uh, as of last week, end of April, um, we've had nearly 3,500 full text views uh, of our research uh, and hopefully um, that's being used by others in, in their day-to-day -day work. So it's, it's great doing this research um, but, and, and generating this evidence, um, but how can it be used um, to support uh, our industry and support the people uh, around us? We actually ran a post-publication um, snap survey through the Medcoms networking uh, group um, and asked how this research would be perceived and how it might be used. Um, and we've received um, uh, information that 87% uh, of respondents felt that the, the research would have a positive impact uh, in influencing how medical writing is, is viewed through education. Um, and also that 75% of people had or would in the future use this evidence in discussions with their peers, critics uh, and others. 
In fact, I think there's, there's four main groups where this evidence can be very useful. Um, it can be used with, with our academic authors um, who um, we want to show that we, we add value to, um, but we can also use it to help educate around the, the consort statement uh, and, and, and research such as this. We can use it with our clients um, who um, may not understand the, 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 the sometimes cumbersome processes that we have to follow as, as medical publications professionals and also with procurement departments um, to show the value that we bring. And of course we can use it with critics um, and with leaders. Uh, and in fact, it's already being used um, to support discussions with these groups. So for example, um, the Global um, Alliance of Publications, of Publications Professionals, or GAP, um, have already cited the research in their article around myth-busting medical writing. Liz Wager, one of our co-authors and collaborators, has, has, has used the work um, in, in a, an editorial in the BMJ talking about prolific authors. And finally, ISMAP um, have also uh, cited the work in, in a, an email blast in response to news from the Chinese government that they're looking to inhibit medical writing support in China. So it's used, being used by a number of people to defend and also to sort of promote our, our industry. Finally, we're getting involved in discussions around the research. We're currently, as authors, putting together a response to a, an interesting letter to the editor that we, we, that we received at BMJ Open. And through an, an accepted abstract, we'll also be taking our research to the evidence experts at Evidence Live in June 2016. Finally, I'd just like to thank our collaborators and co-authors, um, Richard White and Chris Winchester from Oxford Pharmagenesis, uh, Sally Hopewell from the consort group, Liz Wager from Sideview, um, Catherine Sheard from the University of, of Oxford, uh, and uh, Will Gatchell, Kate Young, Stephen Lang, and Lizzie Costigan, uh, who are former employees of Oxford Pharmagenesis, and in particular, Will uh, Gatchell, who, who led uh, and was the driving force behind this research, which was all funded by Oxford Pharmagenesis. And just to leave you with some contact details, if you'd like to discuss our research further, or if you have any ideas uh, for future research, and also uh, to give you a couple of links to our research, the BMJ Open article, uh, and our research that was published at ISMAP this year. Thank you.